th this lecture, sort of give you the difference what we're doing this year versus last year. This lecture I'm, I'm gonna talk about was actually combined into a single lecture. Um, so we were doing scheduling and like query processing all in one. And so now I, I'm splitting it up and so that way I can go over it more slowly over the, the scheduling aspect of things. And then the next class after, well, the next class is the midterm. And then after that is spring break. And then after that is proposals. So then it's the next lecture we'll have will be on the, the query processing stuff. Um, so before we get into that real quickly, I want to make a, 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 a one correction uh, of something I said last class. So this is the second year row I've made this mistake, where when we talk about the DBDK, which again, that was the kernel bypass method for to allow you to read and write uh, on buffers on directly on the, on, the, on the NIC. And I said that, like, uh, as far as I know, you can't get it for Amazon EC2. Turns out I'm completely wrong about this. Um, You've, Amazon's actually supported this since 2016, and I found this out because somebody tweeted at me uh, when I put out the lecture last week, said, oh, you're wrong. Here's the, here's the description of, of what Amazon does. They call it the Elastic Network Adapter. Um, and then I, I feel like more stupid about this is because someone actually tweeted me, uh, the, guy, the guy that, that runs ScullyDB, <laughs> he tweeted me, oh, by the way, uh, in December that you can run uh, DBDK on, on EC2. So again, just DBDK is, is a... It's a very interesting tool, our library that, that, that I think is systems should look at, but it's not easy to implement. But apparently it's on Amazon, so it should be portable. So, all right. I love being corrected, because I, I, you know, obviously I, I, I want to know I'm wrong. All right, so today we're going to talk about scheduling. And as I said, when we looked at the diagram of the overall architecture of the system, where we, where we were at in the semester is that we've sort of covered everything we need to know about storage, We've covered some concurrency control and, and indexing stuff because that, again, permeates th all throughout the entire system. And now we're looking at how we're actually going to execute queries. So last class was how do we, how do we take a request? What is the pro wire protocol we're going to use to communicate from the client to the server, get a request for a query in, or in order to be able to execute it? Now there's a step in between where you have to actually turn the, the SQL query into a query plan. That's the query optimizer, which we will cover, uh, unfortunately, at the end of the semester. But now, at this part here, we're assuming that we have a query plan that has a bunch of operators that we want to then invoke on in our system. And then those are going to be uh, you know, computing the query, generate some result that we send back into, to, to the client as part of the response. So there's a bunch of uh, terms I want to define here going forward so that when we talk about different aspects of the system, we have, again, the common vocabulary for these things. So as I already said, a query plan is, is it's the, the query plan that the optimizer generates, and it's going to be a, a tree structure, right? At the leaf nodes, you have the access methods where you actually access the data in our storage system, and then they shove that data up into other operators to do filtering, joins, and other things. So all those operators in that query plan, well, they're called operators, right? Uh, we'll make a distinction between physical operators and logical operators later on, but for our purposes here, it doesn't care. So like one operator could be a join, one operator could be a group by or a, uh, a projection. So the, at runtime, though, when we actually want to execute the query, if we're going to run it in parallel, then for each operator, we're going to have multiple instances of that operator. So well, you guys read this about in, in, the, in the Morsels paper from Hyper. If I'm going to scan my table, I'm not going to have one thread just be in charge of scanning that. I'm going to break it up into these chunks, which they call morsels, and have multiple threads doing the scan in parallel. So what I'm defining as the instance of the op that in an operator instance is, is the one thread who's taking that task that's doing the same, again, high-level operation. It's part of the same operator in our query plan, but it's a single invocation of it. So the, now at a more high level construct, but we're not gonna care about so much here, is this notion of a task. Um, and this is where we can have pipelines where we can take a sequence of, of operators within our query plan or operating instances and invoke them within the same, uh, the same they're, they're part of the same invocation on, on one of our workers. So again, thinking about a query plan, we'll see examples in a second, but like, I don't want one task to be the scan and the next task to be the filter. I'm actually going to do that immediately one after the other. So we'll call that the task. And that's the thing that we're going to hand off to some kind of worker queue and have the system schedule that for execution. So the problem we're trying to solve here today is that 
we have some query plan, we can break it up into operators and have operator instances, and we need to figure out how we're actually going to run this in our, our multi-threaded, multi-core environment, or even a multi-socket environment. Um, and in, so again, we're, in this class, we're focusing on single node systems, but if you're in a distributed system, you have to make the same, you have to make the same decisions, right? If you think of like a, a, a you know, a, a multi-socket, multi-core system, it's just a fast distributed system, right? So what do we need to be able to figure out? Well, we got to figure out how many tasks we, we should use to divide up our query, how many CPU cores we should be using as we execute this thing, um, where those CPU or where those tasks should actually execute, and that actually is going to be a big issue we want to deal with, and then when a task completes, it's going to have some intermediate result. The question is, where do we actually want to store that? Right? Because think of, think of the, 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 the operators are feeding one. The output of one is the input for another. So where do we actually want to store the output of one task or one operator so that when the next operator gets it, it can be close by or we, we can have it efficiently? So as I say through all throughout the entire semester, the end of the day, we want to do as much as possible ourselves. We don't want to rely on the operating system to really do any of our scheduling for us because we know exactly what the query is trying to do, because we have the query plan. We know what all the operators are. We know roughly what the data looks like, or hopefully you know, we know what the data looks like based on our statistics. So we're in a better position to make a decision about where to place these things than the operating system. Because the operating system just knows that you're just, you have some threads, or you have some, some threads that are just reading, writing data. But it doesn't know at, sort of at the, what are the high level semantics of what they're actually doing or that the output of one, one task would be used for another one. So this is why, we, again, we want to do everything ourselves. We don't want to let the operating system manage this for us. So the, today's agenda, we're going to focus on three problems. First, we're going to talk about at a high level how we're actually going to design a, uh, a multi-threaded or multi-worker system. And then we'll talk about the big issue of, of being aware, where the, uh, being aware, how the system be aware where it's storing its data in our, in our, on a machine, actually in memory, and then what the performance uh, penalty or performance gains we can get by having threads operate on data that's local to it. And again, that was a big aspect of the Morsels paper. And then I'll finish up talking about two different scheduling approaches, which again, one was the Morsels from Hyper, and then we'll look at a more sophisticated or complex scheme from a research paper from SAP HANA. And I'm picking the HANA paper because it's sort of going it's like it, it, they're, the trade-off between work stealing versus not work stealing and trying to have a dedicated pool just for workers versus a dedicated pool for the entire system that can do anything. So uh, it, it's two contrasts, two different approaches to do um, of how to assign tasks to workers. Okay, so this we covered in the introduction class, but I think I, uh, I want to go over it again because it's, it's going to be relevant for our discussion here and for next class. Um, and also, the, 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 we'll see that the, you'll see to understand, this will give you a better understanding of why we choose one particular process model, the multi-threaded approach, versus the, the, uh, the other approaches. So the first thing we need to understand is what is our database systems process model? And we're defining a process model, essentially how we're going to organize the system's components to run in parallel in, in, with multiple workers. So a worker is just this, this thing in our system that it can, can knows how to take tasks, execute them, and produce results, right? So we don't want to call them threads because we'll see an exa in an example next slide where the worker could actually be a process, not a thread, even though it is, you know, a single process is still a thread, right? Um, so again, there's different ways to do this, and we want to, we, we, we want to organize in such a way that we, it's sort of a trade-off between software engineering complexity, uh, resiliency to crashes, and isolation between the different workers, um, and actually just in terms of better getting the, the best performance. So there's a great paper, or sorry, the book um, from Joe Hellerstein, Mike Stonebreaker, and the guy that runs most of Amazon AWS, James Hamilton, where they sort of lay out what's the architecture of a database system. So I, I really like this book. You go should check it out. It sort of covers some of the same things we talk about in the intro class from a, from a, for a disk oriented system, but he sort of lays out like, here's the architecture of actually building the internals of the system. Um, and they cover a lot of things that we already covered, but it's, a, it's a, another perspective on the, on the problem. All right, so there's three approaches to do uh, for process models. So you can have a single process per database worker, you can have a process pool of workers, and then you can have a single thread per database system worker. And again, the spoiler is that this is what we use, this is what every modern system uses, but for historical reasons, there are systems that use the other ones. 
All right, so the process per worker approach is that every worker is its own separate operating system process. So uh, it has its own PID. It doesn't have a parent PID. Um, actually, it's not true because it's a fork. But like, it has uh, it's just, again, it has its own address space. The only way it can communicate with other processes, other workers, is through shared memory or some kind of uh, inter process communication, like a pipe, right? So the basic idea is that you have your application send a request to some kind of dispatcher. All right, in Postgres, this is called the Postmaster. Um, and then the dispatcher is responsible for handing off your request to some worker. And then now the worker can go back and communicate with the client and say, I'm your worker. I'm in charge of whatever you, you, know, whatever you need. You, you can send queries to me. And then the worker knows how to take any query request, run it on the database system, and send back the result. So if we want to need to run our query in parallel, then this worker needs to write to shared memory or do a slow message exchange between other workers because they're not in, in the same address space. So this is what you see in older systems for historical reasons. And I'm going to take a guess why. When I say older, I mean like the 1980s, 1990s. He says things crash more often. Yes, but no. In the back. Bingo, exactly. P threads, like POSIX threads, did not exist back in the 1990s, 1980s. Like there's a bunch of shit we have now that we take advantage of. Yeah, threading library, P threads, right? Back in the 1990s, 1980s, uh, there was no standard of what the threading package was. So all these different Unix uh, variants had their own threading package. So if you wrote th uh, a multi-threaded uh, database system to run it on BSD, there's no guarantee that it would run the same way on Solaris, because Solaris had its own threading package. Right? P threads changed all that. So again, these, these older systems like Oracle and Postgres and, and DB2 were written at a time where you didn't have a portable threading package. And so they used, you know, most operating systems would support, you know, multi-processes and shared memory. So you would use that instead of, uh, of threads. A variant of the process per worker is a process pool. And the basic idea here is that you still go through a dispatcher, but instead of having one dedicated worker assigned to your, your client request, it can hand it off to, to any worker, right? And then now if you want to do multi-threaded queries, uh, sorry, uh, sort of parallel queries, this thing could then talk to other workers that may be idle to hand off portions of the query plan for it to execute and, and get back results. So this is actually what Postgres does now in the newer versions since like 9.5, like, like two or three years ago. Like, because Postgres used to be, you can only have a single process execute your query, a single worker execute your query. And now they can hand off the query and run it on parallel uh, on different workers. So again, you get the same isolation that you would have from, in, from memory, because each process has its own address space. And then in order to communicate that with this, you've got to go through shared memory and, uh, or, or an IPC. So how do we do scheduling on this for either this approach or the previous approach, if these are all processes? Exactly, the OS does it. We can't do anything, right? Because everybody is their own first class process. We can give hints to the operating system about who gets priority, like setting it like the nice flag, but the OS is gonna decide who, who does whatever it wants or who, you know, how, how to organize these things. Um, so as I said, Postgres added this very recently. DB2, you'll see, is gonna do all three approaches because DB2 is actually, I've since learned it's four different code bases because uh, there's one that runs on, on like Linux and Windows. There's another version that runs on like uh, ZOS, their mainframe. And there's, like, there's like two other versions. And they have to run in all these different environments. Uh, and so they need to support all these different models. But again, I, I think if you, I actually don't know what you get if you get the, like the Linux version. Um, it, might, it might be the, uh, the process, process per worker model. All right, the last one is the most common one, at least in more recent years. And this is what, how anybody building a new system today would actually do this. You use a multi-thread you know, multi environment. Single address space, you have a bunch of worker threads. You, whether you assign one worker thread to, uh, to a connection or whether you assign it to a pool and, and be able to read from a task queue, it, you know, we'll get to that, that question later. But the basic idea is anybody can communicate with anybody. Anybody can write to, share, or to, to the address space. Therefore, you need latches to protect things, right? So again, this is what everyone uses uh, uh, up, you know, in, in modern times. It's because p threads is, is common enough, right? So what we actually did when we first started building Peloton, the old system, since it was based on Postgres and it was Postgres was a single process uh, per worker, 
we wanted to make it multi-threaded for performance reasons, and we ended up porting the entire thing. If you go Google multi or multi-threaded Postgres, you should see my, my PhD student posting on like the, the Postgres mailing list saying like, hey, we did this, here it is. Uh, we also converted it to C++, which was, was another undertaking that I regret, but that's okay. Um, the, it actually was kind of crazy. It turned out that like, rather than going trying to take the Unix code and make that a ver the Unix version of Postgres, because it's like the same code base, but they have these pound defines to say if Windows, if Unix, right? Turns out if you take the Windows code, for whatever reason, it was easier to convert that to make that multi-threaded with p-threads on Linux than taking the multi-process version of, of Postgres. Um, but again, we, we abandoned that and threw the all the code away. All right, so as I said, like the, 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 the multi-threaded approach is the way to go now because it has, uh, I mean, it's easier to engineer because you don't worry about uh, the shared memory stuff. Um, there's less overhead now when you have context switches because it's just threads running in the same address space and threads more, are more, more lightweight in the OS to do scheduling. Um, and we have to be careful to make sure that if we, you know, we don't want our threads to crash because if one thread crashes, the whole thing comes down. Um, so it, it is, in other aspects are easier for engineering, other aspects are harder. So the other thing I'll point out too is that we'll talk about query parallelism in, in the next, next couple lectures, but just because you're using a multi-threaded uh, uh, process model, you have, you're using threads for your workers, does not automatically mean you're going to get inter-query parallelism. So what I mean by that is like just because your, your database system itself is multi-threaded, you still may be only executing queries with one thread at a time. So MySQL does this. MySQL can, is, it can only do single-thread execution. Um, but modern systems you know, try to avoid this, especially if you're doing OLAP, then you have to have parallel queries. You have to have this. Um, as I said, I don't, I'm not aware of any, other, any new system built in the last 10 years that isn't multi-threaded, with the exception of the systems that are based on Postgres. So there's a lot of systems that take Postgres, fork the code, as, you know, as we sort of did, and rip it out bits and pieces to add in the new stuff that, that, that's specific to your new system. And in that case, unless they do what we did and actually go make the effort of making it multi-threaded, then they're all going to be the, the process per worker model, right? And it's become, it's become less of an issue since Postgres supported uh, parallel queries. In the old days, it was problematic. All right. So regardless of how we're going to do our, what process model we're going to use, um, the the allocation of, of tasks, of, you know, the method we're going to use to figure out how to uh, assign tasks to workers, is we still have to be in charge of figuring that out, right? Because we want to make sure that we assign workers to tasks that are going to operate on data that is going to be physically close to it. All right? This means we need to be aware of what the actual hardware looks like. Like at the, at the, at, in terms of the dims and the sockets that we have. So to understand this, we need to understand what the memory layout could look like. And the distinction is going to be between uniform versus non-uniform. So uniform memory access is, is the old way of doing uh, multi-socket or multi-CPU systems. Right? And the basic idea is that you have a bunch of CPUs, and each CPU has their own local cache, like SRAM, L1, L2, L3. And then, in order to read data from, from the, the DIMMs, the memory DIMMs, you had to go over this thing called the bus. You basically say, I want to read memory that's in this DIMM here. The request would go up into the bus, and the bus would somehow find, we knew where the thing you, you wanted is, goes and, goes and gets it for you and brings it back down. So, in this environment, the cost of getting data at any one DIMM is roughly the same. Okay, remember I said that the, 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 the hardware, especially x86, they're going to go out of their way to make your job easier as the programmer by hiding the complexities of you know, multiple DIMMs and, and multiple sockets. Right? They're going to make sure that everything's cache coherent, and they're going to allow you to have a single process run on, on multiple uh, sockets at the same time, and can, each socket can access any, any, any address in memory. So they hide all that from you. So in that environment, again, in that case, if, I'm, if this thread is reading uh, some memory that's over here, it costs the same as going and get it through the bus as over here, right? Now, it does all the cache invalidation stuff for you as well. Like if I write to something in here and this guy has a cache, 
the, the, the bus handles that for me too. The main thing to understand again is like the, the this bus is sort of like is 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 just things sort of ruining everything and making sure everything costs the same, uh, even though something might be physically close to it. So this is the old way people built built uh, sort of parallel uh, hardware um, on on a single machine. Uh, it might still exist in, in in embedded devices, but like for like x86 or modern Xeons, it, they they don't use this. They instead use what's called the non-uniform memory access, or NUMA. And you, you, hear, you hear me refer to this multiple times this lecture and then going forward for the rest of the semester. So now, the way this looks is that you have now, say we have four sockets. Every socket, again, has its own L1, L2, L3 cache. Um, in, in the, in the multi-core sockets, or the, the multi-core Xeons, you'll have uh, every core will have its own L1, L2, and then L3 will be shared for the entire socket. And then that each one is going to have its its own set of DIMMs that are physically close to it. So this CPU can read and write to memory to its local memory here really fast. And we have the same guarantee that I said in the last slide, where it's the same uh, cache coherent address space, even though our process may be running on on, on multiple sockets. Right, the, the hardware pr provides all that for us. But now, if we need to access memory that is over here. We had to go through this thing called the interconnect to get to uh, this memory region because you're essentially going through the socket to get the data you want, and then it comes back over the interconnect, and then you cache it. So again, this memory is far away, so going getting memory from from here is more expensive than getting mem memory from here. And so normally we don't we don't care about this. Normally we actually don't know about this. If I just malloc something, uh, I don't you know it's just going to show up wherever. We'll, we'll talk about that in the next slide, but. In, in my in-memory database, I'm going to care about this a lot because now I need to know where do I actually want to run my task, where do I want to run my operators so that my threads are always operating on data that's over here. So as I said, this is where all modern multi-socket systems are implemented. So in Intel, they call it, it used to be called the Quick Path Interconnect, QPI, in 2017. That, they felt that name wasn't good enough, so they announced the Ultra Path Interconnect. Um, and AMD, for the old days, it was called the Hypertransport. But now it's called the Infinity Fabric, right? And I, I don't know what it's called in Power or ARM. But the idea is basically the same, right? So this idea of splitting up the database and then storing it at different locations in a way that we can maximize parallelism and, 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 and locality of the data we access um, is not, again, not specific to a single node system or this NUMA architecture. This is a classic problem in distributed databases. Like, how do I split my database up, store it in different nodes, in my case here, uh, you know, different sockets, so that I can take my work, my queries that show up, and either route the query to the right location that has the data that, all the data that it needs, or take my query and split it up to, 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 to subtasks or plan fragments, and distribute those out to, to the places where they have the data. Right? So, as I said, the, 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 the Harvard is going to do all this work for us to, to, to make it easier for us as programmers to, uh, to not worry about where the data is actually being stored. But because we're database people and we know better, then we can actually uh, exploit some of the syscalls and the, uh, the information that the OS and, and the Harvard provide for us to make, our, to make sure that we, we do things correctly. So, what will happen is, uh, if you actually want to figure out where your data is located, there's a syscall called move pages, where you can pass this thing a memory region, and it'll come back with the, uh, like, so you pass it a memory address, and it'll come back with a NUMA region, which is essentially the socket, that'll tell you where a particular piece of data is located on. And then you can also use this syscall to say, take, give it a, for a given memory address and a size, you tell it what, what, what socket you want it on, and it'll go ahead and move it for you, right? So we could just load our database, let it land wherever it wants to land, and then go back and, and move things around as needed, right? They, they, they actually expose this for us. But that would actually be kind of, kind of crappy to like load you know, a one terabyte database, then go back and figure out, figure out how to divide it back up and move it around. So we actually want to do it as, as we're creating the data. So my question to you guys is, let's say I call malloc, because uh, I want to you know, allocate a bunch of chunk of memory that I'm going to store my data. Right? It's, the, it's the data table. 
Assuming that we don't already have, uh, our allocator doesn't already have a chunk of memory already allocated for us, it has to go get new memory from the OS, what actually happens? Yes. What's that? He says that's break. Uh, not yet. Actually, S break doesn't extend the address space, does it? Actually, yes, it does. Yeah, so he's right. It is S break. Yeah. But what does that do? Yeah, so he says, yeah, so I've already explored it. Um, so, correct answer is sort of nothing, right? So, what happens is you go to the OS and you say, I, I, we, we want more memory. So, it's going to call, make that sys call where it's going to extend the data segment for our process. But the key thing to understand is that this is just virtual memory. And as I said, virtual memory is not backed by physical memory until you actually try to use it. So even though we extend the, the, the data segment of our process, all the, it's just, it's just all just bookkeeping in the OS, right? Uh, it's only when we actually try to go access that, 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 the location of the memory we were just given, then there's the, then there's the interrupt. And the OS says, all right, you're actually going to use this memory. You weren't just lying to me. Uh, let me go actually back what you're trying to touch with physical memory, right? So now my question is, where is this memory going to be stored? Like what, like what NUMA region? All right, we have two choices, right? So the first is that we just let the OS do whatever it wants to do. Um, and in that case, it can just do like a, a round robin approach where it says, all right, the last chunk of memory I allocated was on this socket. Now the next, next, next chunk I'll allocate on this other socket, right? And so it just goes around that way, right? A better approach is actually what we probably really want is called first touch. So we want whatever the CPU, wherever the CPU of the thread that accesses that region of memory, you know, that's going to be running on a socket. So wherever it's running, then that's where we want the, that our virtual memory to be backed by physical, physical memory from its local DIMMs. So there's a, there's a command called NUMA control. Um, I mean, I, I, there's also a sys call for this as well, but you can tell, basically give hints to the OS and tell it, I want to do this, right, rather, rather than this one, because I think this is the default, right? And again, like the OS is trying to be the jack of all trades. It's trying to support any possible application you throw at it. It means your web browser, your, you know, your Bitcoin miner, your database system, but it can, we can give it hints to make it do, you can bend it to our will and make it do what we, want, what we really want to do. It's going to give us the best performance. So this solves the problem that I said before where I want to load it into one, ter one terabyte database and I want to have it go to the right DIMMs as it's getting loaded in rather than me having to go back and do a sequential scan on everything and uh, call move pages to move things around. I think also too, in some, I think in x86 as well, I don't know whether this is true or not, uh, I think it tries to be smart enough about like, if you see one thread writing to a memory location over and over again, that's in a remote, uh, you know, NUMA region, like on another socket, it'll, it'll move it for you. Um, but we're really focusing on, uh, you know, we're, we're doing OLAP queries, then it's never going to get written. It's just going to get read a lot. So we, 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 may, we may not want to rely on that. And we might as well just do it ahead of time since we know exactly what's going to happen. So let's look at it and see that what the performance difference you can have for being smart about where you schedule, schedule your tasks or your threads based on where the data is being located for both OLTP workloads and OLAP workloads. So in OLTP workloads, again, these are, these are transactions that want to touch a small amount of data um, and you know, also maybe update a small amount of data. And we, in that case here, we have, we, have, uh, we, have a bunch of, we have four different choices we can do this. So this is a paper written by the, the SureMT people out of EPFL by Natas Alamaki and her students. And so they're going to configure the OS to store, spread the data across evenly across four different sockets, group all the, the, the data you want on a single socket, split it across two, or then let the OS do whatever it wants to do. Right? And so this, they're going to run just the payment transaction in TPCC. Uh, which is sort of a write heavy workload in, for this benchmark here. And so, no surprise, by putting everything on the same socket, and because transactions need, need such data across all four partitions, or all, all four chunks, then you get the best performance here, right? And the OS does sort of okay. Um, actually, and it's, but it's, you know, it's not, not much better. This is the worst case scenario. So it's not doing that much better than the, than the worst case scenario. But again, by knowing exactly how what the transactions are going to do, storing the data at the right location, making sure threads get assigned to those locations when they run, that's how we get the best performance. 
So for OLTP, the impact is, you know, it's, this, this, is, this is good, we're getting better performance, but our improvement here is not that much, right? We're going from maybe, it looks like 8,500 to maybe 10, 10,000, 11,000 transactions per second. Like a 10%-ish improvement. Whereas the difference, performance difference roughly between a, uh, a local memory access and a remote memory access over the, over the, the interconnect, it's about, could, you know, in raw numbers is like 3x. So let's look at the workload for OLAP queries. So this is an actually an experiment uh, that some former students of mine did a few years ago. Uh, I think this, this is like part of the project for 618. They, did, they built a little query engine. And so this is running on a beast like eight socket machine in the PDL. It's a bit older, but uh, it's, it was the only eight socket machine we had, had around. And for this experiment, they have a database of a single table with 10 million tuples. And they're just going to do a sequential scan on, on that entire table uh, and just you know, filter out some things and see how fast you can actually go. So the size of the, the table will be the same, but along the x-axis, we're going to scale up the number of, of concurrent threads that are running. And then this little uh, vertical line here is when we run out of physical threads, and now we're running with hyper-threading, right? You're running with the, the virtual threads. And so at the very beginning, there's not that much difference in performance because the since the the size of the database is fixed, the number of threads you have uh, are increasing, so the probability that your thread needs to access data that it's, that's on its local NUMA region or on its socket is much higher here, but then as you go up, go up and higher, the probability becomes less and less, and so now you're going over that interconnect, you're essentially saturating it, and that's why you don't, you don't get any performance improvement as you add more cores, right? And then the, 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 the plateau up here, just because hyper-threading is not real, like we're, we're CPU bound, so hyper-threading is actually not going to help us here. Right? It's not, not like we're waiting for I.O. From the, from the disk. Right? So the red line is, in, is when we're controlling where things are actually being stored and make sure threads only read data that's local to its socket. Um, and then the, this one's just random. Right? So again, so this matters a lot. Uh, this is like almost like the best case scenario because it's a really simple application. There's obviously other aspects or other uh, things that are running in our database system that will, you know, make the gap not be that significant. But like, this is just showing that it, it matters, and we make sure that we we store our data correctly and assign our tasks and schedule them correctly. Okay. So again, uh, yeah, sorry, question or no? Okay, sorry. Um, the we're not going to talk about partitioning so much here. We'll talk a little bit about when we talk about doing parallel hash joins, but the, this is going to assume that we have a way to intelligently divide our tables up and sort it in, in the different sockets. Right? The easiest thing to do is just round robin, like every tuple shows up, I say you go to the first one, the next guy goes to the second one, right? And that will divide our, our data evenly uh, across all sockets, but it, it, we're, get, again, we're giving up some, some, some high level semantics about what the actual data looks like that we may need later on when we actually start running queries, right? Or if we do, if we do partitioning based on uh, the actual attributes themselves, then we can be assured that the, you know, when we do joins, that the, the, we're joining the inner table and the outer table, they're already uh, partitioned on the join key on a single socket, so therefore I don't need to communicate with other sockets to do the join. That's like the best case scenario. So this is why typically for, even though we're on a single node system, we still want to do partitioning, which is very common in distributed systems, for making sure that we, we, we divide the data evenly across our sockets. So placement is basically, after you've, you've, you've generated what your parti partitions, now you've got to figure out where you just assign them. Because right? typically what you do is you, you create more partitions than, than, than sort of sockets you have to place them on, and then you just need a way to decide how to, how to store them. Right? And again, there's different trade-offs on how to do this. Round robin is probably the easiest one to do. Uh, you could try to then balance, like if you know the data might be larger on one node, but like most queries don't, most queries are going to filter out most of the data on that on that socket for whatever reason. So therefore, maybe you overload that one versus another one, because it can computationally be less expensive than than other nodes or other other sockets. All right. So what do we have at this point? We have a process model. Uh, we have a worker allocation model, I actually skip that, but we have a task assignment and we have data placement. So we know how we're going to uh, take tasks and assign them to, to, to NUMA regions or sockets because we think that's going to get the best performance. Um, and, but now we need to figure out how we're going to take a set of tasks from a logical query plan 
and split them up into uh, to subtask and actually then be able to run them. So again, we'll, we'll discuss this later in the semester. Like a logical query plan is basically what the, the what you get from almost like the abstract, abstract syntax tree of a a uh, of the parser, and then the optimizer generates a physical plan. So we're now we're figuring out how to actually execute those operator instances in the physical plan. So for all to be queries, this is really easy because we, there's no parallelism we can have. It's because it's going to be like go grab this single tuple. We can't parallelize that. It's really for for this lecture and for the most of the rest of the semester, we're focused on OLAP queries because that's what we're going to do, large sequential scans that we can run in parallel on multiple cores and multiple sockets. So again, we need to figure out how we're going to take uh, a bunch of worker threads we have, a bunch of tasks we need to execute for our queries, and, and match them up. Right? So the easiest thing to do is what's called static scheduling. And this is where, the before you even start executing the query, you just assign this task that's going to execute this thread. And nothing changes as you're running the query, no matter whether the, the distribution of the data looks different than what you expected, uh, if other queries show up at the same time, you just say, this is the plan and I'm sticking with it. Right? This is the easiest type of scheduling to do. Right? So the problem with this, though, as I said, there could be issues where we maybe, you know, maybe assume that the data was, it was uniformly distributed for how we're doing filters. So like we think that we have a, a one terabyte database. It's split across four different sockets, and every socket is going to filter out the, 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 the same amount of uh, data, and every socket is going to do, every socket is going to do the same amount of work. But then when you actually start running it, you may find out it's not the case at all, and some socket may be uh, oversaturated or, or inundated with more work than other sockets, and those other sockets are now idle. So this is what dynamic scheduling is going to solve for us. It allows us to be able to, on the fly, recognize that uh, how to assign tasks to worker threads based on who is available to, to do the work. So the paper I had you guys read uh, was a thing from, from the hyper guys called uh, Morsel Scheduling. Um, the way to, so Morsel is, so if it's a hyper term, it's not like a standard term used in databases. I think it's because they didn't want to use partition because that word is used all the time. And they didn't want to use block because, again, that's used all the time as well. So they're calling these things morsels, which are slightly bigger than, than what we normally think of, of a block, but smaller than what we normally think about uh, in a partition. So what they're going to do is they're going to have one worker per CPU core. They're going to do a pool-based task assignment, meaning the, the worker threads are going to look in a queue, pull out tasks to execute, and then when it's finished that task, it goes back and pulls, pulls another one. And then they're going to do a round-robin data placement uh, across the sockets, you know, to spread out things in, in the different NUMA regions. So we won't talk about this now. We'll talk about this uh, when we talk about parallel hash joins, parallel sort merge joins. But they have a, uh, what they we're calling a, a NUMA aware operator implementations where the, the, as you're executing the query plan, the operator themselves can recognize that I'm reading data that's local to my NUMA region, therefore I, I should do things a certain way. Or I'm reading data from another NUMA region, I should do things another way. And likewise, when I write data out, I want to make sure I write it to my local NUMA region and not some, someplace else. All those things you got to be careful about because, again, like the if you're doing this across a lot of data and a lot of a lot of tasks, then this will this will cause problems. So they're not going to have a separate dispatcher thread. As I said, they're doing pool-based uh, scheduling in the single task queue. Everyone goes grabs things out as needed. So you don't need a dispatcher thread to assign things uh, to the to the different threads, um, and the what will happen is when a thread goes and tries to say, I need work to do, looks in the task queue, they're going to prefer tasks that are going to operate on data that's local to it, that are in the same NUMA region. But if there's no tasks available, then they do work stealing where they go look at other tasks that may not be in the, its local region and go ahead and pluck those guys out and run those. So the idea is, again, you prefer things that are local to you because that's how you get the best performance. But if no, no tasks are available, then you go take other people's work. So let's look, look, look at the example. So the first thing we need to do is divide our, our table up into morsels. So say we have a really simple uh, four-column table. Again, a morsel is just taking a, uh, a, uh, all, the, all the attributes for tuples within a single uh, segment and store that as a single morsel. And then you sign that to, to one CPU socket. So I think in the paper they talk about a morsel in their world is 100,000 tuples. Um, 
For reference, in the old Peloton code, we did a thousand tuples per block. Um, in the new, uh, the new version of the system, we do one megabyte of data per block. And that do, that, we do that be uh, aligned at 20 bits for addresses. We, we can talk about that offline. Um, in HDOR, we did uh, uh, 10 megabytes per block. So in the old code, that was 1,000 tuples, and in the HDOR was 10 megabytes. We just picked those numbers up, you know, we just made, picked those numbers. We, there's no you know, magic or, or deep reasoning behind them. In their world, they're saying 100,000 tuples is the right number because that gives you the right amount of parallelism without having to be too large. It calls bottlenecks, but, it, but you can have them sort of spread out or be divided enough that you can run things in parallel. All right, so now you actually want to run these tasks. So again, we have our query plan here. Each of these guys are an operator, and then we're going to divide them up into operator instances. So like for this one here, we want to build a hash table on for B. Um, say we're doing like a grace partitioning or partition hash join. So each of these guys could be, could be a task that, that could run on some morsel of data. Like we divide B up into uh, three morsels, by, divide A up into three morsels. So for each socket or each core, it's going to have a directory with the morsels that it has in its local memory. So there's this internal catalog that says if you want, uh, you want a morsel that has data maybe in this, these ranges, Here's where it's actually being stored. Actually, no, they're doing round robin partitioning. So there's no high level semantics about what's actually inside these morsels. It's just, you know, there's, there's a morsel here, right? Then each, each socket is also going to have its local buffer. And this is a local memory region where they're going to store the intermediate results that they're going to generate as they execute tasks. So I want to start running. Um, and say I pick the, these first three tasks here, we want to build a hash table on A. So Say that, that socket one has morsel one, socket two has morsel two, and so forth. So these, the, 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 the threads will go look in the global task queue and say, well, these are the tasks that are operating in data that's local to me. So let me, go, let me go grab those guys, right, and execute them. So they pull data up now through their, through their, their local memory, operate on them, and then they produce results. So they store it back in the buffer, right? All right, so let's say that the first two threads uh, complete uh, finish very quickly because again, like say there's some we're doing a filter, they end up filtering out 99.9% .9 of the data, so we're not spending a lot of time building our hash table. But this other guy here, he's gonna he's he's for whatever reason its filter is not very selective, so it's gonna run slower. So the first two threads they go back to the queue and say, well, I have these other two tasks I want to do. I want to you know do my build on the build side uh, or do partitioning for B that gets one and two that way, and again. For this one, they don't actually need the intermediate results for their buffer that they just stored. The, 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 the output of the old tasks are still sitting in the buffer here. So let's say this first guy completes, and now he goes back to the task queue. And at this point, you recognize that this thing is, is running slowly. So the remaining tasks are on, on, on for this guy here. So he's going to go ahead and steal that task and start running it. And the idea here is that by the time this thing finishes, this one will also be finished. So, so we're, we're finishing all the tasks we need, or all the operators we need within this task before we go on to the next stage of the query plan. Right? In the Hadoop world, this is called stragglers, right? or you're basically doing speculative execution, assuming that this guy is not going to finish in time uh, by the time this guy finishes too. So even though we have to go get memory that, that's, local, that's, that's remote over here, right? Uh, by the time this guy finishes, then this guy would finish as well. Right? So that's basically what we're, do, we're doing at, here at a high level, right? And again, and it still writes the output of, of, of the result for this task, even though it read data from over there to its local buffer. And again, there's some, there's no centralized coordinator to figure this all out. It's just we know what the tasks are for our query plan. We know what depends on what other, uh, what output of one query, query task depends on the input for another query task. We know all that so we can keep track of how we actually stage these things. So, again, the, the dealing with the work straggler is because we only have a single core per, uh, or single thread per core, and so that core can only be really processing that one query, or one subtask. And so, again, to avoid stragglers, we have to make sure that um, we make sure that they, you know, other threads can steal those things uh, from the global work queue. So, in the paper, they talk about how they use a lock free hash table. To, to maintain these global work queues. We'll talk about lock-free hash tables in, 
in the, in, after, the, after the, the spring break, there's, there's really no magic to them. It's, it's you know, you just do the compare and swap stuff that we talked about before, right? All right, so this is an approach of doing work stealing with a, uh, with a single queue or single global queue for the entire system. So now I want to talk about another approach that doesn't do work stealing um, or not in the same way that, 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 that the hyper guys are proposing. And they're now going to have actually multiple worker queues per different, per socket or, or per NUMA region. So this is, a, uh, this is a research paper published in DLDB from, uh, it was written by a PhD student at a, at a, a, a German university, um, but he did it on HANA because they had this arrangement where they can, they basically get paid by SAP to work on HANA stuff, but then they, they get a PhD at the, at the university, right? So instead of getting paid like crap like a PhD student gets in, in the United States, they get paid real money and they can do research. But the company owns everything, which is, you know, it's, it's may or may not be a good idea. So what they're going to do is that they're going to have uh, different types of queues for each each socket, and you have this notion of a hard queue and and a and a, and a soft queue. And the idea is that threads can't steal any work from the hard queue, but they're from other sockets, but they can steal work from the soft queue. And instead of having a single sort of you have a bunch of threads that can only do task execution for queries. They're going to have these different types of queues for all different parts of the entire system. So what I mean by that, in the hyper approach, for these threads back here, these, these are only running queries. Then there'll be a separate thread pool to run networking stuff, thread, separate thread pool to run you know, background garbage collection or, or other maintenance tasks. Right? In this HANA paper, they're going to have thread pools that can can, that can get swapped around as needed for all different parts of the system. So let's say reckon, right now I recognize that I have not a lot, there's not a lot of networking requests, so maybe I, I scale down the number of networking threads that I have, but then I increase my number of background worker threads to do garbage collection and other things. So that's why I like this paper, because it's a really interesting idea about how do you, you know, what should the threading model look like for the entire system itself, rather than just focusing on the, on just the, 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 the you know query execution. So because now you have this notion of you need to move things around, you need some kind of way to coordinate all this, right? So they call this a watchdog thread that basically goes around and checks all the, these queues for these uh, these different components in the system, and can change the the, the status of the threads based on how it th thinks it needs to reorganize and balance the system to to, to get the best performance, right? So the basic idea, again, the, 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 for every, every thread group on a socket, you have a soft and hard priority queue. Um, you're allowed to steal thread pass from other uh, thread groups from the soft queues, but you're not allowed to steal from the hard queues. Um, and then now within the thread pool, there's going to be four pools. Sorry, within a thread group, you have four pools of threads that are going to be in different states. So the, the, the easiest state, the first state is, is called working, and this is where the task, the threads are just executing tasks that, that, that it pulled from the queue. Then you have inactive threads that are blocked inside of the kernel by taking a, a latch, and that, that causes the, the OS to, to, to not schedule your thread for execution. Then you have a free thread where there's no active task you can work on right now, but it's just spinning and checking the queue you know, every so often to see whether there's something new for it to execute. And then the last one is a park thread, and this is again like free, but it's not allowed to, to wake up and go check the queue. The, the, the watchdog thread has to come along and poke it every so often. So this sounds very complicated, right? What does this sound like? An OS, exactly, right? So, so this is a good example where we could potentially get better performance in our system and have it uh, manage it better because we are controlling exactly how we're scheduling all these different threads in our system. Now, of course, means now we're, we're building a whole scheduler in, in, in our OS or in our database system on top of the OS's scheduler. And now we need to make sure that we understand what the OS wants to do versus what we're trying to do here. So, uh, right, so the way they're going to make this new aware is that they're going to pin the threads based on, uh, the, the, the threads can move around in the system. But they, they'll be pinned to a CPU based on whether it's CPU bound or memory bound. So like if my task I'm trying to execute is memory bound, then I'll pin it to the, the core 
of where that my memory is located. But if I'm CPU bound, then maybe I let it jump around to different sockets, different cores, because the OS can then let me run on any, any you know, whatever core has free is, is idle, right? So the main takeaway, the, the more interesting aspect about this, this paper that came after the, the, the Morsels paper is that they comment that when you start looking at machines with a, a really large number of sockets and CPU cores, then the work stealing approach that the hyper guys talk about actually becomes detrimental because the overhead of moving data around at, at such a large scale on a single machine becomes problematic. So I think in the hyper paper, they looked at mostly like two sockets or four sockets. The HANA guys are talking about machines with like 64 sockets, right? Or, or even higher than that. Um, I think SGI sells, they, they, you know, there's, as I said before, there's, I, the HANA guys talked about they had some customer that's running on a machine that they, they maxed out two to the 48 uh, address, address spaces of memory. I, even that wasn't big enough. And that thing has just had a ton of different sockets. So the, again, the other thing too, as I said before, is that these thread, they're using these thread groups for everything, not just for task execution or queries. They're using it for networking, they're using it for garbage collection, which that part I really like. Uh, this might be an overkill for what we try to build in our own system, but I think this idea, if you want to have complete control of everything that's going on in your system, then you want something like this. And I suspect the, 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 the major vendors, DB2, uh, SQL Server, and Oracle, do something similar to this. All right, so let's look at really high level what this looks like. So this say this is, again, we have a single thread group, and we'll have a single thread group per socket. And then we split up these different queues of our, 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 our sets of, of threads. We have our working threads, inactive, free, and parked. So up above, we have the task queue. Uh, so these are all the tasks we have in our, in our system right now. But then we have a bunch of them will be assigned to the soft queue because these will be things that that we want to execute at this, at this region, but we're okay with somebody else coming along and stealing it from us. And then say we have some other background tasks like garbage collection or say whatever for whatever reason these subtasks of this query plan, these are in our hard queue and we that prevents anybody else from coming along and stealing with them. So again, the, in the paper they claim that you want to put everything in the hard queue and just completely disable work, uh, work stealing if you're running on a, on a large, you know, with a large number of sockets in your system. So the working threads are all actively pulling from some kind of work queue. Uh, the inactive threads are stalled in the OS. Uh, the free threads are, are spinning every so often to see whether there's something there. And the part queues are, have to be poked by the watchdog thread to say, hey, go check the queue. So now what happens if I say we have a three thread, free thread checks the queue and says, oh, there's something for me to execute, then it's allowed to move itself to be in, in the working state here. Then when it comes back, if, if it sees that there's another, not, there's not another task ever, it completes the task that it pulled out, then it goes back and becomes, becomes free. All right, so any questions about this? So again, we, this is the idea we're trying to do in dynamic scheduling inside the database system is essentially have the threads that are gonna run tasks run on, on the data that's local to it in, in its NUMA region on the same socket. If the, uh, and then we can decide whether we allow threads to steal, steal work from other tasks or other threads that may be reading, run, reading and writing memory that's, that's, that's remote to where I would be running. All right, so next, the last, the finish up, last question of if we end up saturating our system because the, the clients are just sending us too many requests faster than we can uh, process them, this becomes problematic because now we become, we become overloaded. Right? We're getting more requests and, and at a rate faster than we can, uh, we can process them. So we need to be able to make sure we handle that in our scheduling system. So again, the OS is not going to help us, right? Because if, there's CP, if we're CPU bound, there's really nothing it can do, right? If we're memory bound, meaning we're going to start running out of memory, uh, the, the OS has this thing called the out of, out of memory killer, which is basically, it picks a random thread, which is usually gonna be the database system thread, picks a random thread, kills the process with a sig term, uh, and then frees all your memory, right? Which is the, the worst case, case for us because we're the, you know, we're assuming we're running on the database system, we're the only thing running on this machine, we, we're, we're, the, we're the most important thing. Even if we weren't the only thing on the machine, we're still the most important thing. And, they, and this thing comes along and shoots us in the head and takes all our memory, which is like, you know, it's bad, right? And obviously, if you're CPU bound, this is essentially the same thing as memory bound, because what will happen is you'll keep getting requests 
the queues will get longer and longer uh, until eventually you, you run out of memory, right? So the easiest way to solve this in our database system is just like throw our hands up and kill ourselves, right? Which again, that's obviously bad because now we have downtime uh, and that doesn't really solve our problem. So the, the this, this sort of problem is called flow control. Again, we're not we're not we're not going to get into queuing theory. We're not going to get into uh, sort of the more theoretical aspects of actually handling this. We're just going to talk. We're just going to talk about the engineering approaches we can do in our system to take care of this. So the two ways to handle this are emission control or throttling. That should be one or two typo. Um, so emission control is basically you recognize that you have back pressure, meaning you can't process the requests faster than than they're arriving. So you basically prevent the uh, the clients from sending new responses or new requests because you immediately kill them or you abort them. So they'll send a request and you immediately come back with a with a failure message, and then hopefully they get the, you know the client is smart enough to recognize they shouldn't do that. Or, you know, then they back off for a period of time, right? So in um, in uh, at least I know in Postgres, but in a lot of protocols. Uh, for database systems, like in the network inside the wire protocol, they don't have a notion of of, of this back pressure. So you, there's no there's no hint you can pass back and say I'm I'm rejecting this because I'm overloaded. The newer systems do actually support some of this, but traditional systems don't. Um, the other approach is you throttling, and basically you execute queries just as fast as you could as you before. But when you get the result, you actually hold on to the result and and, and not send the response back right away because you're assuming the clients are running with an, in, a, in a synchronous model where they send requests to you and then wait for you to send back the response before they send the next one. You just wait a little bit before you send back the response and that should, uh, that should prevent them from immediately coming back and firing another one. Right? Simple, both are simple approaches. Uh, you kind of need both of them in your system. Now, the second approach, the throttling one, this doesn't... This doesn't work if you have an asynchronous uh, submission scheme, meaning you're allowed you're allowing clients to submit requests and then go off and the thread can go off and do other work while they're waiting back for the response through a callback. Right? There's some newer systems that actually support this. Um, if you if you if you're doing this and you're screwed, this doesn't really help you because it's going to go fire off the next thing without actually waiting. Right. So. We would need both. We want both these approaches in our database system. It's not clear to me whether this is actually on the networking side. This is not really. It's a networking protocol issue and a scheduling issue. I'm just bringing up here because now we sort of understand all the things we care about, right? All right. So to finish up, the the database system is a beautiful creature, right? It's it, we want it. We want it to be uninhibited by the operating system. So we want to let it do whatever it wants to do. So that means we want to manage everything ourselves. But in order to do this correctly in a modern system, we need to understand what the harbor actually looks like. And the main thing we're going to care about here for an in-memory database is, is the NUMA regions, the sockets. Where is, actually, where is memory actually being stored? Because right? we can assume that the, uh, you know, the, the, the CPUs are all going to be the, have the same performance. So my thread, my computational task I run on one socket should run the same on another socket. But if I had to read memory, then where it actually runs uh, makes a big difference. So the way we do this is basically track where memory is being stored and assign tasks to uh, the sockets that will have the, the, the data that they're going to process on. And we know what, what data they're going to process on because we're the one that, that created the task because we, we, we divided up our query plan. Right? So again, as much as possible, we don't want the OS rain on a parade, so we want to talk to it as we, we, we want to reduce the amount of communication or reliance we have on the operating system. And then where necessary, we provide it with the hints we want to tell it to make sure we, it, it does the right thing for us. OK? All right, any questions about scheduling? All right, so in the last five minutes, I want to talk about the extra credit assignment. So I'll, I'm going to post this out today on Piazza. This is not something you have to worry about today, because obviously the midterm is on, on Monday. But you should be thinking about this uh, over spring break. So we're doing the same thing we did last year, in the, in, or last semester, in the introduction class, where well, I'll give you 10% extra credit for the, uh, for the semester on your final grade if you write an article, uh, an encyclopedia-style article about a, your favorite database management system. Um, so it's sort of like Wikipedia, but instead of having this free-form, you know, semi-structured text, uh, 
The way it works is that we have these, uh, these features about the database system where you select what options they have, and then you write a description of, of, what the, of how they actually implement those options. But if you ever go read Wikipedia, sometimes you'll see things like uh, they'll, they'll use different terms for two-phase locking or MVCC or OCC or indexes. Right? Sometimes they call it a B-plus tree, sometimes they call it a B-tree, where there actually is a distinction. But you know, in Wikipedia, it's, it's, people use the terms interchangeably. So the idea is that we have a, a standardized taxonomy that I've defined for all these different features, and you select those things, and then you write about how they do it and provide citations. Right, so the website is dbdb.io. Uh, it's, it's the database of databases. And again, I, this, this screenshot's old. It says 560 up there. We're up to like 583. So it's every single database system, both academic, open source, and commercial that I'm aware of, including some historical ones. Um, and you can go along on the, the side here, and, and you can select these different options, and actually you filter down to see the ones that you want. And then the articles essentially look like this. As I said, there's the different features, what the data model is, concurrent control, checkpoints, and then you select the options of how they do things and, and then write about them. Right? So uh, all the articles will be hosted on this website. Uh, it's basically, it's, it's like Wikipedia, where you have different, different revisions, and you keep track of your changes, and, it keep, and it's assigned to you. Um, so what I will do is I will post on Piazza a, a link to, uh, or I'll add a new sheet to the, to the Google spreadsheet where you can sign up for, uh, for what system you want to, to cover. It's first come, first serve. But we've also had, you know, since this is like the second time we've done this, there's a bunch of systems that have already been filled out. So you have to make sure you pick a system that you haven't picked before, right? And so you should have no problem finding a database system you like. As I said, I'm aware of 583 different database systems. So like if you're interested in graph databases, we have those. If you're interested in distributed databases, we have those. Uh, think of any aspect of, of, a, of a system that you care about, there's a database system that, that does it. If you like blockchain, there's like a bunch of blockchain databases. I learned a new one uh, you know, on Sunday, right? I guess it was yesterday. So there's a ton of systems. You should have no problem finding one that has not been covered that you know, piques your interest. Now. What I will say, though, is that uh, you should be careful because some of these systems that, I, that, I, that are on there were like startups that were around for like two years and then they went under or got bought. So email me and ask questions because, again, I'm the one who populated the, 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 the database. I know roughly how, you know, where these systems come from. So I can tell you whether this is going to be a good idea or a lot of work. So last semester we had somebody uh, picked this thing called Cornerstone, which was a... It was, a, it was a video game company in the 1980s, decided to get into the database business. So they had a database for three years, and then it went under. And the, so she was looking for like, documentation from like, 1986 to 1989. Right? It was, I, she, she, she actually reached out to like, the authors and tried to like, find people that, to talk about this. But like, that, so that was a nightmare. Um, the other thing I'll say, too, is like, for some systems, obviously, Oracle is super well known. So if you pick Oracle, then the expectation is that you're your article should be very complete and very thorough. If you pick, I mean, the, the 1986 one was a bad example, but like if you pick one that's a bit more obscure, uh, you may have a harder time finding things, which, so, which you basically want to describe to me in your write-up what you actually look for. The other thing I'll say too, if the system is actually still active now and you can't find the information you want, go contact them. Go email the developers. It's like, hey, look, you know, how, you know, how do you actually do things? And they'll tell you, right? Like, so last semester we had uh, somebody uh, contact Tal DB. Like, the, the, the co founder of the, of the company was helping them figure out how they actually do things, right? And the issue was they were writing, she, he was describing how the system does things to her over the email, but you couldn't cite the email. So then they end up had to make a, uh, she had, went back to like the, their message boards for the company and asked the same question, and he just took the email and copied it in there. So that, that way we could cite them, right? <laughs> So it's th you know things like this. You know I, I understand that like not everything is going to be easy to easy to find. Um, most of the, all of this is in English too. I would say that's that's the other thing that surprised me too. There's some systems. There's been some systems. Obviously, there's systems in other countries, but like most of the documentation for everything, there's only like one or two. The Japanese ones are hard to find. There's like one Russian one I couldn't read either. But like most of the and the Chinese ones as well. But um, you guys, some of you guys have no problem with those. All right. So again, have fun with this. Right? It's not meant to be super hardcore. Again, ask the people who did it last semester. Was it fun? He says, okay. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> All right. So I have to say this. We can talk offline why. Uh, please do not plagiarize. 
So what does that mean? Do not copy and paste shit from Wikipedia. Do not copy and paste from their documentation, right? And post it and, 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 and as, as the description. I don't care that you cited this, right? That's not how this works. You can't just copy things and say, oh, I cited it, I'm done. It has to be everything in your, in your entire, written in your own language. I don't care if, you don't, if, you, if your English is not as good as theirs, or you think you can't write as well as them, it has to be in your own words, okay? And this includes both when you submit it for your final grade, but I'm also going to offer you guys, as I did last semester, halfway through, you can submit it for review, and I can give you feedback and say, hey, fix this, fix that, think about this, right? That has to be all in your own words, too, okay? And I will know when it's not in your own words, because this, there'll be words that I don't even, normally don't even use in my day-to-day -day vocabulary that you start using. I'm like, there's no way, right? <laughs> So some things will be really obvious. Or also don't like We'll take it all fine. Okay. Next next class, midterm. Okay? It'll be fine. <coughs> Any questions? Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle I guzzle cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is wet. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. They go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the silly cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.